Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this hour and this minute. We thank you for all those who have taken time out of their busy schedules to be here today. We thank you for this situation, the students and faculty that have joined together to bring awareness on an issue that is plaguing our communities and our nation as a whole. We ask for special blessings over the Brown family and the Ferguson community. We would like for you to give them your peace, your peace that surpasses all understanding. And Lord, we ask that when we all leave this place for never your sight, that you will give us tribal grace. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to um, hear from Professor Jacqueline Nash from the Southern University Law Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayala, uh, for all the part about what I would say and uh, if my comments would be based on my 32 years experience as a practicing attorney in the field of juvenile justice, if um, my comments would be fueled by my position as a stakeholder in this community. I live here in Baton Rouge. I work here as a professor. Is if that is where I would speak from, uh, the, the young ladies who put this rally together asked me to speak from my perspective, and um, because I have so many perspectives. I decided that my perspective in speaking on this issue would be as the mother of a 19-year-old African-American baby. Sure, sure, that perspective overshadows all and informs me as an attorney, as a professor, as a community stakeholder. I want my child to do quite simply. And every time he leaves home in his uh, sports car, I pray a prayer that he comes back. And I fear that he will be victimized, could possibly be victimized by the police. Now, what is significant is that I have a personal relationship with the chief of police of Baton City Police, and he's here, Chief Gavin, who always comes when we call and who assures us that the Baton City Police will do what they are supposed to do. And I, I think right now we need to applaud Chief Gavin. He's committed in making sure that our kids are safe. But this is what I want to say as a mother of a 19-year-old is that we have to teach our kids, irrespective of their race, of their educational level, social economic background, where they live, whether they live off College Drive like we do, or they live design city or from the park, other people, Scott and Hill, wherever they're from that they have to be consistently guided by the principle that they may be viewed as a target. And so they have to always be right. They have to be always right. And I think as parents and as young people who are in law school and in college, what we have to say to kids especially little black boys is, you have value. So act like Act like you have value. You conduct yourself like you have value. I think we should all be outraged, heartbroken. What happened to Michael and Trevon, and it's happening every day in the streets in this city, is gut rich. And I think we have to be the voices to stand up to say, 
no to injustice. Do not shoot. Do not make assumptions about persons, about how they dress, or what they're doing, or what neighborhood they're in. I think we have to be vocal. We have to say to lawmakers, we have to say to our city councilman, we only have one here. She's the only one here, Denise Marcel was the only one at a candlelight vigil we had for domestic violence two weeks ago. We have to say to our representatives, our legislature, our councilmen, our mayor, our judges, we have to say take a stand against violence. Speak up against violence. Make the police accountable. It's kind of hard to go off on the police when the chief is here. <laughs> I think the Baton City Police really, they do a good job. They arrest my clients, but that's okay. <laughs> I gotta have a job. <laughs> Sometimes my clients are arguing with me. Okay. But I think it has to come from us. That's where it begins. By coming to rallies. But is that enough? No. In your actions in your deliberations, in your day-to-day, -day, when, you, when you're just talking to your friends, when you're at church, when you're at sorority meeting, I'm calling out the sororities, I'm in one, I'm in the first one. Hmm? What, what are we doing besides sipping tea and eating cake? We ought to have a financial support of what's going on in the answer in the community. In the city of Baton Rouge, we have a 52-bed detention center. It's full today. It's full. 98% of the occupants are African-American males. We, you know what? We don't have a viable mentoring program. Mentor, reach out. You're all students in law school, in college, in high school. Y'all, I don't know if y'all still say this, but y'all got it going on. Be an example. Go out and reach kids. Because most kids who are in trouble, they're in trouble because they don't think anybody cares about them. They're in situations that are desperate, which means there's disparate treatment of them. So, beyond today, what is the challenge? I challenge you, I'm not going to challenge y'all to the ice bucket because I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but this is my challenge. You be the one. You be the one. It's not you. It's not I. It's not me. It's us. It's we. It's our. Good afternoon. Let's try this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And it is a good afternoon uh, here to be at Southern University. I'm honored and I feel privileged that I've been asked to participate in this rally and in this challenge. And I was just recently asked, um, I think yesterday, uh, to participate. So I was not uh, privileged to exactly what all it entailed, but I did know that you guys were going to stand up against violence. You were going to stand and, and talk about how we could prevent those things from happening that happened in Ferguson. How we could support the families, of the Browns and the Trayvons. Uh, what it is that we can do as a community. Uh, I believe that, and I was just talking to her, she said they wanted me to speak to the challenge. And I believe a part of the challenge is, Jackie mentioned it, that we have a, a, no, no self-worth uh, for, our, for our own selves, for our community as a whole. And when we start to, to look at ourselves and accept that we don't we have a, uh, a low self-esteem, we don't care about ourselves, and we carry ourselves in a manner, then a lot of people start to look at us in the same manner. And I know a lot of people said that uh, when it's black on black minds, that we don't say anything. And that's true. Uh, but when it's white on white crimes, it's the same.
same thing. My point to you is we have to change our mentality as a people. We must learn to love ourselves first before we ask other people to love us. Yes, the police has a higher duty. They have a higher expectancy. We expect them to hold a whole law, not to break the law. And the chief is in here, he will tell you that I'm an advocate for my community. I serve District 7. I serve some of the 705, 702, some of the crime pockets of the city. And everybody in those pockets are not guilty. For the majority of the people that live in my community, they are law-abiding citizens. But there are those who break the law. The, what the challenge, I believe, is, is to get the police departments all over the nation to respect people as people, period. I believe another part of the challenge is that although the chief may be on the same page with me in terms of not having police uh, go in and do seizures improperly or kick in doors without a proper search warrant or, you know, getting people uh, using excessive use of force, although he may be of that mindset, everybody in this department is not. Let's just be honest about it. Everybody at the Manhattan City Police, on the Sheriff Department, are the state police. Because that has festered so long in a lot of the departments. And a lot of it, it has to be weeded out. So how do we weed that out? I believe the challenge is when a police officer does do something wrong, or your children do something wrong, or someone you know, that you need to follow the process. And I find that a lot of times we don't get results because we don't follow the process. They will call my office and say, Councilwoman Marcel, uh, this person, uh, this office is constantly wreaking havoc in your community. And they are unlawfully searching vehicles. And they are uh, kicking people's doors in without the search warrant. But when I tell them that they have to follow the process and go downtown to internal affairs, and they say, their answer is going to the time the same. Oh, they're not going to do nothing. Well, I challenge you to follow that process and to see that process through. Because the chief does care, but he can't do something about the number that he doesn't know about. So if it's happening to you, if it's happening to someone you know, I challenge you to follow the process and follow the necessary steps. And you know, I. I don't have any problem with saying that a lot of the things that I believe have occurred in my district, because I ride in my district, I, I work in my district, I live there I'm on the street, a lot of stuff that they do are not, it's not right. It's not right. But it's going to take the chief, it's going to take people that are standing up. I heard say that the mayor needs to stand up, the state legislators need to stand up. The senators need to stand up, not only when they want your vote, but they need to stand up because a lot of us are just too scared to come up and say, what's really going on? Right. They're scared that somebody's not going to back them for whatever their next move is. But if I cannot stand for my people and say what's true for my people, I might as well stay at home. Because this is about our city, this is about our communities, and this is about our nation. Because it's not just happening in one place. It happened in Ferguson because it was on camera, and so now you know. But since the cameras have become, uh, everybody has one of their phones, I want everybody to raise your hand if you got a video recorder or a camera in your phone. Well, since the, the technology has taken us to where it is, a lot of the stuff is being recorded. And I encourage you to record the police because they ought to be above reproach. And in fact, I'm thinking about introducing that order that I tell us to the chief, y'all. Get it close to <laughs> That all police officers wear a camera on them so that we can know we can keep the police right and we can keep the people right. I believe that holds everybody accountable. Do you agree? Yes. So, well, if we got police that aims their camera and cars a certain way, and you can't see what they're doing, that's the problem. That's the problem. So we are, and I have a member of the chief, we are trying to address these issues.
issues, but there are challenges on both sides. The police is not always right, and they're not always wrong. I just say that we need to come together as a community, stand up against violence, not only uh, with police officers against our people, but violence against ourselves. Violence against ourselves. I've gone to too many families of young African American males in my district that we need everybody hurt. The parents hurting, the person is hurting, they have to go to jail, they got to pay fees. The system is being drained by the legal fees. If you can't pay it, then we have to pay it. I don't know if y'all know, but y'all are paying a lot of legal fees. The indigent defender, the public defender, Mike Mitchell, does not have enough money to continue to represent these children. And it's a real problem. So I say to you, we, we, we must pray and see God and turn from our wicked ways. And then we, He heal our land. But we must come together as a people. And today I pledge to you that I will continue to pledge to hold everybody accountable for the actions in the city of Baton Rouge. I'm Professor Shanique Lebray. I work at the Law Center. I teach constitutional criminal procedure. I've been um, teaching constitutional criminal procedure for 10 years now. And it still often really surprises me that there are so many people who do not know some of their basic constitutional rights or who are either afraid or intimidated about asserting those rights. So they just wanted me to talk a little bit about some of those constitutional rights but I knew that we had uh, quite a few speakers here, so, you know, and I knew that people would be generally talking about those things, so I decided to just write a poem that I felt like sort of embraced those ideas as to why we're here. So last night, Ms. Catino, who is the coordinator of this event, uh, yesterday was her birthday, and last night they had a party. Some of you all may actually have been there. But I told her when she asked me if I would come by, I said, do you want this poem or do you want me to come over there to the event? And I guess I selected the event and I guess she selected the party. <laughs> so, um, but in any event, um, there's certainly a theme that's going on here. And that theme is one of mutual responsibility. Okay, I believe everyone's sort of speaking to that issue. And to be quite honest, that may, that may be the reason why there are some people who decided not to even come here today because they may be questioning whether or not Mr. Brown upheld his end of, of that bargain. I believe that that is what some people are really concerned about, you know, because they may be feeling like, well, we're not dealing with someone who may be a completely innocent victim. We don't know that. We certainly do not know that. But I do believe that there is some doubt in some people's minds. But what I'm here to really talk about, though, is that very same thing, about knowing your rights, about asserting those rights, and about the mutual responsibility that we have with respecting the rights of others. And so this is the point that I wrote. It's called, I Have a Right. As a citizen of these United States of America, I have certain rights. Rights that are in the United States Constitution, but they did not derive from the United States Constitution. They are God-given rights, my own natural rights, preserved in the Constitution. Born in this country, bred in this country, having forefathers who toiled and built up this country, a citizen of this country, I have all the rights, privileges, and protections that are promised to me. I have a right to the free exercise of religion, to worship my God, to serve my God. I have a right to freedom and that there be no restraints on my liberty by detention, custody, incarceration, or assassination without due process of law. I have a right to be free from suspicion just because of my existence my economic status, the community in which I live, the verbiage that I use, that I can't lose. That's just me. I have a right to a higher standard. 
than just a hunch, passion, bias, prejudice, preconceptions, misconclusions, conjecture, unlawful intrusions. I have a right to decline to consent to searches of my effects and of my person, to demand the neutrality of a judge imposed between you and me. I have a right to assert my rights without fear, without intimidation, to have my rights fully respected with due process of law and equal protection. I have a right to stand here today to freely assemble with my brethren, with common mind and common thought, to stand against brutality from those charged to protect us, to serve and to respect us. I have a right to stand together as those who came before us, who walked these same hallowed grounds, stood together in the 1960s in sit-ins and peaceful protests, risking arrest, suspension, exposure, to sit at counters and to be served the most basic of all requests, to be treated equally. Just as my right to speak, I have a right to remain silent, a right to refuse to speak, to say nothing if I choose not to that could incriminate me. It is my right as a free citizen to the highest burden under the law, beyond a reasonable doubt, is the standard that has been granted to deny my liberty. And just as I have this right, they come with responsibility. I must respect the rights of others as I have them respect me. Respect their property, respect their freedoms, their different views and their opinions. Respect their rights and their religion, their right to speak and to assemble. Because we all stand here together with a common passion for a common purpose. Standing side by side for justice, not just for Michael, but for all our brethren. As our hands go up for justice, may our cry be heard for justice. Though we all stand together under the umbrella of the Constitution, may we honor and respect each other, not because it's in the Constitution, but because it's what we should do. Thank you, Thank you all for inviting me here this afternoon to speak. Uh, as in what Councilwoman Marcel said, I completely agree with her 100%. Uh, we have to stand united. If we want to bring about change, if we want our community to change, if we want our community to be a place where we can raise our children and give our children everything that is granted to them in that Constitution about the point which she just read, and those things that are guaranteed to every person, not one person, not one sect of persons, not one color of persons, every person, that Constitution covers everybody. It doesn't take anybody out of it. In order for us to do that, we've got to stand together. We've got to be a united front to bring about change. That's what has to happen. Since becoming chief uh, about 18, 18 months ago, uh, I did a self-examination of the Beverly Police Department. I tore everything apart and tried to put it back together. And there were some things that had to be changed. And I made those changes. I started in my administrative offices and basically cleaned house. I have moved everybody out that was in command before, and we started a new. We started with fresh faces, fresh ideas, not some of the old salts, but some of the young guys. Some of the young people who have better, who have more forethought, who are looking to make change in this community. First area of concern that I had was in internal affairs. I had to bring a system where the community, as this myself said, a lot of times people don't want to come and tell me that they have a problem. A lot of times, if I don't know there's a problem, I can't fix it. I have 670 police officers in the city of Baton Rouge. I can't keep up with every movement that they do every minute of every day. I entrust the community to let me know that there's a problem. And trust me, Ms. Marcel will check me when she has a problem. And she'll call me on Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon or whenever. And uh, she'll tell me her problem, and I'll look into it, and we'll, we'll work through it. But a lot of the problem was it wasn't convenient for the community to come in and talk, to come in and lodge their complaint. You know, just like everything else in our system and our policy, there's a due process. When, when an officer has a complaint against me, I have to 
to afford him the right to the uh, police officer's bill of rights, and then I have to afford him the right to the uh, uh, union police contract. But there is a process, and there is judgment, and I have handed out a lot of discipline since I have taken office. I believe that this community needs to be treated fairly, with respect, without regard to what your skin color is, what your sexual orientation is, what your economic status is. Everybody is given respect. Period. Born and that starts from me, and it goes down. And I believe that. I truly believe that. And I work hard with my AA people every day to make sure that my officers are doing what they're supposed to be doing, when they're supposed to be doing. Now, Baggage Police Department is no different than any other major corporation out here. This is no different than any way that you go. Everybody's not working. I do have bad apples. I will say that. Yes, I do. I'm working very hard to rid my department of bad apples. But in order for me to do that, I need you to tell me. When you have a problem, when you have an officer who goes outside of the law and breaks the law, the one thing that, that we as police officers raise our right hand and swear on the Bible, that we will uphold the laws of this state and the laws of the Constitution. We, we make that pledge. I believe in that pledge. But when a violation of that happens, you got to come tell me. You've got to come to me and then let the process take its place. Trust me. It will work, it takes a little time, you probably won't get immediate action, but it will work. Now, y'all are all going to be my witness, because when I bring the council the bill for all the cameras that this person wants Muslim officers to wear, I'm going to need your back. Y'all got to come back here. Y'all heard me say it. Uh, and to be quite honest, we have looked into the body of cameras. Uh, at this point right now, you have cameras mounted in your cars, and to be quite honest, they're very expensive. They're about $5,000 for each camera that goes in each car that we have, and they are expensive. The body mount cameras that uh, Mr. Marcel was talking about are a little bit cheaper, but then you have to get a camera for every person. So the, the cost kind of weighs out a little bit, but we are looking into that. I've already gotten with one company that we have already TME that camera, uh, we had some problems because the, it mounted on the lapel, and we got a lot of pictures of people's shoes. Uh, didn't work out too much. So what we're working on now is a camera that has a center-mounted lens that sits right here in the middle of the chest. It seems to work a little better, and before we spend the taxpayers' dollars on something, we want to make sure that what we're buying is actually going to work and fit those needs. And I'm all for it. In my opinion, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have any reason not to put that camera on.
to help us in unity and no matter what they did. My first call, one of my first calls when I was in uniform patrol is I got sent to a lady's residence and she didn't need the police. She didn't need law enforcement. She needed somebody to help her move her refrigerator. She couldn't find anybody else to do that. Now I could have easily told her, look man, we do law enforcement, I'm not, I'm not a furniture mover, and I can't help you. But it was much more important for me to go in there, move her refrigerator to where she wanted it, and then I went on about my business. Because that's all she needed. That's all she wanted. She just wanted her refrigerator moved and didn't know where to go. She called 911. They sent her back. <laughs> but, but my point is, that's the type of community service that we have to do. We have to help our community with what they need. We spend, the state of Louisiana requires for you to be an officer in the state of Louisiana, you have to have 300, and, don't quote me on this, but I think it's 370 hours of training to be certified in the state of Louisiana as law enforcement. Our basic academy right now will do 786 hours of training. In that training is use of force training, is defensive tactics, is search and seizure, is law, is due process. All of those things are included. Now we could just do the bare minimum and I could get those officers out in about half the time that I'm doing that. But I don't think the bare minimum is enough. You are all, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of y'all law students, right? Are all of y'all law students? Not all, but no, but no, no. How thick is the law? Can, let me answer this question. Can you get what's in that law book in 40 hours? No. The state of Louisiana requires a law enforcement officer in the state to be to have 40 hours of law. That's it. 40 hours. How much can we cover the 40 hours? Not much. Not much at all. It's just really enough to make you more confused than anything else. What we do is we increase that time frame because we need our officers to be more in tune with what because we're held to standards. We're held to everything that you're going to cross-examine me on later in your career that's in that law book, right? So my officers have, they have to pretty much know what you know. In a nutshell, you know, not technically, but they do need to have, they do need to have that knowledge. So my point in all of that is we go above and beyond in our training. Not only do we do that training, but we do yearly training. This year we've done diversity training, we've done communications training, Probably the biggest complaint that Ms. Marcel gives me is how my officers talk to her constituents. How do we talk to the people that we're serving? And I've always been a proponent of you get more flies with honey than with anything else. And how we talk to people dictates that situation and what will happen. Because if I come at you hard, you're coming right back at me hard, and then nobody gets no way. So we've, we've spent a lot of time making every officer in this department go through a communications class and learn how to talk to this community. Now, are all of these things going to fix the problem today? No. But they're a good start, and we're going to continue working in that direction. And with your help, we can make the average police department more of what you expect us to see. We give praise and thanks to the community and the help of the something good. We thank him for all of the prophets that he sent when we were going off the path. He sent them to bring us back. We thank him for Abraham, Moses, and Jesus the Christ. We thank him for the honorable Elijah Muhammad who brought us into some truth that we didn't have before that time. And I must say, brothers and sisters, when it comes to a man who stands up for the rights and freedom of black people against the entire world, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Take it or leave it. You can applaud, but you Thank you. With all that, I greet you as a Sisters, I don't have much time, but I, 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 I thought it was my obligation to come. Special thanks to Brother Gavin, and I don't know if some of you there 
because the things that he is initiating in New Orleans is metropolitan area. That's a grown man. He's a grown man in my eyes, and we can talk about that later. Uh, the honorable councilman, council person, sister of myself, am I pronouncing that right? I went to a community event about a year or so ago at a park, and you were there supporting the people. She means what she says. Uh, Chief Daddy, am I pronouncing that right, sister? Thank you for being here. Glad to be in your company. And a special thanks to Sister uh, Shaquan, which there she is. She's part of the president of the Christians at Law. And what is that? The women in law? We're right here. And what is that correction? Women, women in law. law. Women in law. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, thank you so much. I won't be long, but I'm gonna be very frank. And I need to meet that person, because that's a bad man. I need to meet Frank. Because Frank tells you like it is, whether you like it or not. And that is what we need today. The Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan has a lecture series that's out right now, and I implore you to look it up. The title of it is The Time and What Must Be Done. Brothers and sisters, we had you know better than I. You all students, you had the 13 and the 14. Right? It made you citizens, gave you rights. Then if that was the case, why was there a need for a civil rights bill? I'm asking you, talk back to me now. Fifty years ago, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the civil rights movement. Remember that? You know what the cry was then? Justice, jobs, and even rights. You know what the cry is today after 50 years later? Justice and job for black people. You know what it's going to be 50 years from now if you don't learn the truth of who you are at the time and what you must do? 50 years from now, you'll be saying what? Jobs and justice and economics. Am I making any sense? What do we must come into the knowledge of and what we must do different? I can't help but notice the, the overwhelming number of women. They are outnumbered the men three to one. I cannot help but from noticing the front page of the newspaper, and the police chief and Ms. Marcel talk about it. Front page of the newspaper, this innocent child murdered by some black man. This is what we see. Is that the true story of the black man in America? But this is what you see. I cannot help but from noticing that when I look at the television in Ferguson, where that horrible murder took place, do you all notice the high percentage of black women you see in the street? They don't notice that. you see in the street. Yeah. Did y'all notice that? Yeah. Don't be afraid to talk back to me. I'm the one doing all the talking. Don't be afraid. So what is that telling us, brothers? Step up. Take your role. Don't have your women out there in front of the police. Yeah. Take your role. You know what I'm talking about. And the reason why A lot of brothers may have not come because a lot of brothers hear us do a lot of talking and then there's no action. See, real men, they don't want to hear talk. They want to know, say, man, what you going to do? You know how you all do it. I don't know the sound. <laughs> <laughs> See, real men don't want to just talk. Real men want to know. They don't want to hear fancy lectures. They don't want to hear no fancy preachers. They don't want to hear that. They want to know, look, we got to if you're not going to do something, look, I'd rather go on the corner and shoot pool. Am I making any sense? Yeah. So don't throw down on the brothers because they're not here. Let's make our gathering an action item. Does that make any sense? Yeah. All right. Let's move along. You were here in the 
councilman and the police chief laid the foundation. You would hear concerned whites say in public, you know, it's a shame what's happening in the black community. All of the murders and the, the charges, the lack of skill, and they, they say it's a, it's a shame. Somebody needs to do something. Well, brothers and sisters, in our position, you cannot afford to say that. Because that somebody is you and I. See, whites can say that. You and I can say that. You and I are that somebody that's going to bring about a renaissance in the black community. Now, so how are we going to do it, brother? Do you all understand? 